Welcome to the JB's PowerCast, where we talk about industry news, events, performance parts, trucks and accessories, shop talk, and we'll even do a little bench racing. The JB's PowerCast starts now. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in this week here with Corey. Um, very uneventful week. I mean, um, you know, it's been another quiet week in the automotive world. Um, we all know why. We don't have to say, you know, what's going on. Everyone's aware of the situation. The fact yeah. of the matter is, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, yeah, things are slow from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, nobody's in a rush to make new cars or come out with exciting things. Everyone's just kind of hunkering down a little bit. Yeah. But that isn't to say there's nothing to talk about. There's still some stories. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the, you know, literally it's not just industry. I think everybody's not doing anything. That's, oh, yeah, that's no. the goal, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, I think after this, I'm going to send my kids' teachers a, uh, a gift saying thank you for dealing with my kids. Absolutely. Because uh, I'm You've struggling. Just, you're learning something, yeah. aren't you? Well, I shouldn't say I'm struggling. My wife is struggling. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I didn't realize how tough it could be to be a teacher. I hear that. It certainly gives some appreciation. And, I mean, that's only your kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Imagine, like, Another 25 20. others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, there are a couple things to talk about in, uh, in the news, if sure. we want to call it that. So, um, Aston Martin actually has started developing a new in-house engine. Now, this is kind of cool because the last time they developed their own motor in-house from scratch was 1968. For anyone mm. doing the math, it's 52 years, which in the automotive world is huge. Like if Absolutely. You, you know, they've basically been relying on outsourcing, modifying other platforms that entire time. Right. Aston Martin, of course, you know, pretty famed, still surviving British supercar maker. Yep. Um, you know, stuff like the 1-1 one -one and other things that, you know, Aston Martin holds a pretty particular spot in that they can make a million dollar car and they're all pre-sold before they've even started Absolutely. production. Yeah. So this motor um, right now is slated to go into something. We're not sure yet. I don't think they've confirmed, but they, they, have, a, you know, they have a couple concepts out there. They have some more sort of uh, new era supercars that they right. are working on. Right. Um, so the idea is it's going to be a three liter twin turbo V6. Okay, that doesn't sound that interesting, yeah. but they made some changes, some modifications. Right. So what they did, is on the heads, they actually moved the intake ports to the outside, and the exhaust ports, they moved them inboard. Okay. And what that did is it opened up the whole valley. Right. So the twin turbos actually are going in the valley. So that saves a ton of weight in piping. You don't have to put the turbos wherever, pipe them all over the place. Right. Super duper heat efficient. Also super efficient just as far as making boost. I mean, everything's right there. It's basically right. feeding itself. Right. You know, in and out straight away. Hmm. So the idea behind this, it's probably going to be a really, really high revving, high horsepower um, supercar type motor. Sure. Again, they're not going with the V10 or the V12 or whatever. Right. They're they're keeping it pretty straight. And if you you know a three liter kind of hits right in that spot where it, where it needs to. Hard to say what it's going to make for horsepower, but I'm sure it's going to be a lot. Um, well, I think in the supercar world, Aston Martin being one, and and like we talked a couple of weeks ago about the Koenigsegg. They're looking at efficiency first and then horsepower after, and they're still getting the numbers out of the small stuff. Totally. Um, and it's not going to be by itself either. They haven't really said what the whole plan is, but it's going to be paired with some sort of additional electric drivetrain. So odds are, if we know the way these guys work, probably a set of electric motors in the wheels, similar to whatever else is, uh, is sort of doing. So probably what it'll end up being is this new motor will probably be the high-end horsepower top-end part of it, right. and then the electric motors will probably provide that torque. Um, and they'll probably balance each other out like that. So interesting to see either way. I mean, I, I, I always really like um, unique spins on engine designs. Sure. Um, you know, I've always been partial to, um, to boxer motors, you know, flat motors and yep. um, rotaries, of course. Obviously, I've owned, you know, a few of both. And, you know, a, a traditional whatever, V-spec or an inline, that's all neat. But I have always really appreciated when it's just a little bit different, something, something pulls me into a, sure. a little bit of a different design. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see what, what this will end up being. Yeah, and, and I mean, speaking of the rotary engine, I know you, like, you know them better than I do, but the, the design, the efficiency of them is unbelievable. They rev, they, everything is just unfortunate. They really never became I mean, a mainstream thing. No, at the end of the day, you know, they, you know heat is a bit of an issue. You, you can mitigate it for sure. But the, you know, the Wankel just couldn't keep up with at the end of the day, emissions is what killed it. Sure. And um, you know, we're all we're all hoping, we're <laughs> all hoping there'll be another one, Mazda. 
<laughs> we wish, and every year we tease, and it never happens, but maybe one day. Um, I, would, it, I would be so thrilled, and, and me and many other you know, RX enthusiasts, For sure. if they came out with um, you know, a new, obviously they had the RX-8, it's a matter of do they make an RX-9, or do they revisit Retro, the RX-7. Yeah. It's infinitely speculative what they will yeah, do yeah. Um, if they do anything. So. But it would be cool to have that retro RX-7 with something that revs to, you know. Another 9,500, 10,000 10, RPM. Would be awesome. yeah. It would be awesome. It would be awesome. I mean, quite yeah. a bit of time between shifts, which is cool. And Yeah, I, I, I really miss mine. Like, even in even the RX-8, that sweet spot between, like, 8 and 93, and you just keep it in that all day. Yeah. And the motor, that's where it likes to live. It's, it's, it's unlike driving any other kind of engine. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Don't suggest you take your, uh, your traditional North American vehicle to... New. <laughs> 8 no. to 93? No, Is I it, don't suggest yeah. you take your small block Chev and you keep it in the 8 to 9 RPM range. We can help you do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't but know it might take a little bit last. of work. Yeah, just a little bit. might have to do a little yeah. bit of back-end work yeah. on it. Yeah, there's uh, quite a bit that needs to go into it before you hit that 90. Yeah, yeah. Something sweet number, spot. sweet yeah. spot. <laughs> yeah. It'll be sweet for about five seconds, yeah. and then you'll, you'll see what... And then you'll be buying a lot of parts. Exactly. Yeah. Which is okay, too. Yeah, because yeah. we sell parts, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, so I guess next up, this is a bit of a, um, you know, sort of a, a short story, but a happy story. Amid everything that's going on, um, one nice thing is we've seen a lot of manufacturers and companies stepping up to the plate and totally changing a lot in their manufacturing process to help provide supplies, you know, for the ongoing COVID crisis. Right. Supplies have been an issue, especially medical supplies. For sure. Part of that is, you know, people not being responsible with their own purchasing. Yeah. And part of it is it's a sudden surge that no one saw coming. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, we need particular things, you know, breathers and masks and sure. stuff like that sure. um, and recirculators. So, you know, we've seen companies like GM and Ford um, step up and change some of their tooling plants and start making things. But interesting, um, some F1 teams have actually come to the plate and said, you know what, we're going to help as well. Um, Mercedes, Red Bull, McLaren and Williams they are, I mean, an F1 team, if nothing else, they're experts in design and engineering. Of course. They are top of the heap. I mean, that is what they do. They design finely tuned pieces Absolutely. of technology. Absolutely. So they sort of said, you know what, we think we can help. They don't just maybe necessarily want to just start producing, but they said, this is what we do. We're designers, we're engineers, we're technicians. So they're putting their best forward to try and help um, come up with some, some better ways to maybe help with efficiency and production and um, even design and engineering on some of the, uh, the much-needed things like ventilators. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's cool to see because you're absolutely right. Those teams are the smartest engineers in their fields to develop a race car. Yeah. And now they're just switching their engineering abilities to help humanity and, and it's, the world. It's really nice to see. It is. And, and, and this is not done for free. These guys are working and getting paid by the teams and, mm -hmm. and you know, putting an effort in to make sure that they can save a life. Yeah. And, I mean, it's not like they're, you know, they're making parts and selling them for a profit. No, they're, not at all. You know, they're not trying to get anything out of it. Yeah. It's really a way to try and help everybody. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be what has been happening. You know, there's a lot of different teams and groups and manufacturers that are just willing to step up and say, if we don't do something to help, you know, then nobody will. Nobody not, will. We're not trying to, you know, make a buck off of this. We're not yeah. trying to turn a profit. It's just the right thing to do. Yeah, and I think on the Canadian spin on that exact thing, I think I read yesterday that Bauer, the hockey equipment uh, company, oh, is, really? is doing the same. Uh, they're building the shields. You exactly. Know, they do yeah. visors for hockey helmets. They've retooled or restructured or did something that now they're creating... Uh, the, the face shields for the medical professionals when they're in the hospital, you know, so, you know, again, that's a Canadian swing on the same idea and uh, hopefully, like, it, it's cool to see everybody come together. Absolutely. It really is, yeah, you, know, nice. you know, and you know, do your part, do your part, but when you see a company, you know, completely switch and say, okay, we're now going to produce something to help doctors and nurses and the frontline people be safe while they're treating fellow Canadians or fellow people, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's really cool, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a nice little uh, light, you know, in an it otherwise is. sort you of... Bet. Most of the news that comes out is, um, you know, it's not always positive. So no. It's nice to hear some, uh, some nice things come out. You bet. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, it's not really news as much as... It, uh, it's, it's an interesting story. So this week actually marks kind of a cool milestone in motorsports in particular. Uh, Monday on March 29th was a bit of a milestone. So March 29th in 1927... 
which is 93 years ago. Long time. The 200 mile an hour barrier was broken for the very first time. Now, 200 mile an hour is still an insanely impressive benchmark, even today, almost right. 100 years later. It's sort of where they, there's sort of this gap in, in uh, you know, especially in like supercars and stuff like sure. that. That's kind of become the benchmark. I agree. And yeah. if you don't hit 200 miles an hour, you're not in this class. Sure. And if you do, congratulations, you get to play with the big boys. Mm -hmm. Even in racing, you know, um, there's, there's, you either, you're either over 200 miles an hour or you're under 200 miles right. an hour. And you know, if you're 199, nice try, yeah. go yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah, you're um, still in, in, in the amateur ranks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, you know, not, not only that, 1927, it's not like it was the 60s. Oh, yeah. Where we were fully into building high horsepower and land speeds were like a, a, a pretty big thing at that time. Sure. You know, the 20s, you think this is coming off a depression era. Yeah. Right? Um, and we're going for land speed records. So um, what the car was, was a sunbeam of all things. Speaking of British companies. Like the... the, the Appliance sunbeam? No. Okay. No. I was going to say, they really changed. <laughs> yeah, it was a toaster, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, they had a car that they called uh, the Slug. Now, hmm. this wasn't a production car. This was a, a purpose-built land speed car. Right. And they called it the Slug because it was long and narrow and um, not obviously because it wasn't fast. No, right, but it looked like a say. Slug. Yeah, exactly. But it kind of had this, this silly Slug kind of slopey end on it. Um, anyway, what was <laughs> the motors that were powering it? There was two huge <laughs> twin V12 engines that combined oh, wow. were 45 liters of displacement. It made a thousand, just under a thousand horsepower in 1927. It's crazy. It's insane. Um, you know, so you've got you know 24 um, cylinders, thousand horsepower, 45 liters. Basically, the entire the car is super long. The entire thing was just motor, motor basically. Right. And I think they came out of airplanes um, is where they is okay. where they sourced them from. Um, and they managed to pull it off. Yep, yeah, first, not, I shouldn't say first time, but you know, first time someone hit 200 miles an hour. Um, and we still use that as a, a pretty specific benchmark. So I wanted to ask you, speaking of land speed records, do you know what is the fastest you've ever gone in a car? I'd love to know. Because you've done some drag racing. Yeah. yeah. So I suspect that yeah. you've been pretty, you've gotten some pretty high yeah, speed. Yeah, in, in a drag car, I, I mean, 120 miles an hour, 130 miles an hour. I mean, we see guys doing 200 miles an hour. Our owner, Jim Bell, does Absolutely. well over 200 miles an hour. Yep. That's in a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. These land speed guys are taking, I think, a mile or more to get there. Absolutely. But still, you know, yeah, I don't think I've, you know, I'm nowhere near that for sure. Whether it be, uh, you know, I know we have... Officer Mike Winnick coming up, so I'm uh -huh. not going to admit to too many things. But <laughs> um, no, I've never been that close, I, and I don't care if it's a mile or whatever. I mean, who hasn't put their speedo to 160 sure. on their car? But you know, other than that, really, you know, I'm going to plead the fifth. That's fair. Yeah. I my honest answer is um, I don't know. Ah, there and you that go. comes with an interesting story. So when I was um, probably 20, maybe. Um, I went and looked at a car that was for sale, mm -hmm. and it was a uh, it was a 1977 Firebird. Okay, it was a red one, and it, I know of red. course it was. <laughs> and it uh, it had a small block in it, and it had it had a different transmission. I don't remember what it was, but the interior was mostly gutted. The pictures that he showed me looked complete, right. and I showed up, and the interior was like curiously missing. And I thought, sure. well, whatever. So he's like, yeah, do you want to take it for a spin? I'll come with you. Okay, so we're taking it for a spin, and like this thing was fast and hoppy and right. porky, and I was really blown away. And he's like, "Well, take it out on the highway." Okay, so I hadn't really been paying attention that much while we were driving. Sure, got it on the highway, and he says, "Let her rip." Right, right. So I did, and the only reason I'm telling the story is because I was full on, wide open, and by the time I let off, I looked down at the speedo, and I realized it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "The speedo's broken." He goes, "Oh yeah." And I go, how fast are we going? He goes, I don't know, dude. <laughs> but it was pretty quick. <laughs> but it was pretty damn fast. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, yeah, but, you know, obviously going fast is fun. Uh, but, you know, we got to stay safe. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, again, they're building cars now that, you know, walk into Ford, get the GT500, and it's a 10-second in the quarter-mile car. That, of course. That will probably, if you had the opportunity and the space will do close to 200 miles an hour. I, I don't know that it wouldn't. Sure, absolutely. You know, and um, that's kind of scary to think that, you know, well, a lot of us think we're fantastic drivers, <laughs> you know, and, and that we, you know, 
F1, NASCAR, we could do that. Do it's it all. Nothing, we could you know, do it all, yeah. Yeah, big deal. I've watched Days of Thunder. It's all good, right? <laughs> um, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, you have a thousand horsepower and you're driving on the streets and you get on it. There's a good chance you're going to lose control of that vehicle and potentially hurt yourself there's or a, somebody else. I'd say there's a better chance you will yeah, than you won't. Than you won't. You're absolutely you know, playing against the know, odds at that point. Especially at, you know, 19, sure. 18, 21, 30, 40, really doesn't matter 16. the age. But, no. you know, it, it's, it's hard to understand that much power if the only thing you've ever driven is a compact SUV sure. or, or even full-size truck. Yeah, you get on, it sounds good and it goes, but... You know, you get behind the wheel of something that really moves, and it, it can be, things go by really quick. Yeah, and, and most people don't, you know, wouldn't know how to stop themselves. No. I think that's the biggest yeah. danger. People yeah. know how to go fast. Yeah. People don't know how to slow down. Yeah, and understanding that, you know, you're traveling at 100 miles an hour, which is 160 on most of the speedos, but, you know, or give or take, how long it's going to take you to stop. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, you know, oh, I'm in control, and then something you need to move or something jumps in front of you and now you yeah you're not stopping and you're running into someone or something or right and it's and that's uh, just a matter of i mean that's just that's physics yeah if you're going x speed and something comes out at x distance yeah. you literally can't stop in time it doesn't matter yeah. how good your reaction speed might be yeah you're going too fast yeah and that's the end of it. and it's uh yeah it's interesting that you at least see a lot of the professional drivers from the circuit racing or whatever racing they drive very modest mild cars outside of the racetrack mm -hmm. you know and when they do have a Corvette or something like that, you see the videos. They're out of track. Uh, yeah, you know, of they're, course. They're, no, they're, they're not. not they're not ripping know, around on the street. No, no. like they. It's because they, they they understand. Oh, they, I agree. Yeah, they they understand how, you know, two hundred miles an hour bumper to bumper, is a messed up thing unless you've practiced your whole life to exactly. do it. Exactly. Yep. You know, so, but now in the simulator you're safe. Totally you know, safe. Yeah. You get to, you know, no harm. None none whatsoever. No. Cool. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's most of the stories that I had, unless you had um, anything else to, to comment. We could probably take a break, and then yeah. when we come back, you've got a, you've got a, a phone call to make, yep. right? Yeah, we've got a, a guest, guest, Mike Winnick from uh, Blue, Blue Line, Line Racing yeah. and the EPS. We're going to be with him, and we're going to ask him some questions. So we'll see you after the break. Yeah, it should be a good chat. Free shipping available now, and get the best selection of name brand performance parts and truck accessories at jbspowercenter.com. The best prices now with fast free shipping. When you order by 4 p.m. Mountain Time, we will ship your order same day. Shop online now and you get 100% satisfaction guaranteed at Canada's place for performance, jbspowercenter.com. Welcome to JB's Power Center, your one-stop shop for automotive performance parts and accessories. Come into any of our stores and you'll be greeted by our friendly staff. Feel free to browse. And if you're looking for something specific, ask our knowledgeable staff. Check out our stunning car audio room, where you can preview a wide range of speakers, subwoofers, amplifiers, and head units from brands you know and love. Or visit our performance counter and talk to our experts about the engine you're building. If you're looking for a radar detector or a dash camera, check out the displays in our glass showcases and talk to the experts to get yourself the one that's right for you. If you're an off-road enthusiast, JB's has you covered with a wide range of tires, suspension, and just about any other 4x4 accessory you could imagine. And if you need anything installed from our shelves or not, our shop has expert technicians who have installed nearly everything. And it's not just cars and trucks. We install on nearly all types of vehicles like boats, trailers, and motorcycles, just to name a few. Come on down to JB's Power Center and upgrade your ride today. We're back guys. Thanks for uh, tuning back in here. We managed to get Mike on the phone. Uh, Mike, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, Obviously, we wanted you in the studio here with us, but the way things are, we figured the uh, phone conference was the best way to go to keep us uh, all safe and, and follow proper protocol. Um, so, I guess we'll get right into it. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your career with the Edmonton Police Service. Well, good morning. Yeah, and thank you for having me. It's uh, quite the honor. Um, so, I've always, always been uh, into cars. Uh, even as a little kid, I always had my little Hot Wheels, stuff like that. Um, and when I uh, was 12, I uh, bought my first car with my brother. 
So it was a 68 Charger. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty lucky to have that. But uh, it was only $175, a running, driving 68 Charger for that kind of money. And it uh, didn't look pretty. Had rust and missing a fender, but uh, that's uh, kind of what got me all started in it. And uh, since then, uh, had to have a, one of the fastest cars in high school, and I, so I built up a, a duster, little small block. And uh, the year I got my license was the year Speedway closed down. Wow! And uh, yeah, so you can imagine here's a here's a kid all just revved up, ready to go, and. I uh, I had no track to go to, so I ended up taking that onto the streets. Um, from there, I uh, became a licensed mechanic and still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Definitely uh, being a police officer wasn't in the scope. But uh, soon after, um, after a, a few tickets in my car, <laughs> um, I, uh, I actually had to go to headquarters to pay a ticket. And there was some applications as I'm walking by recruiting. So I filled out an application form, and uh, lo and behold, they, they hired me. And I had a fantastic 27-year career with EPS. Um, I worked on the front line out in patrol. Uh, then I worked undercover for about six and a half years. Uh, that was uh, that was quite amazing. And then uh, I finished off my career the last, uh, probably the last uh, 10 years or so was in uh, patrol as a supervisor. Okay. And uh, yeah, so one of the, uh, one of the things though that I had done uh, bef- early in my, uh, my lifetime when I was a teenager still with the duster, um, I was out at the old Beverly A&W every weekend and of course, from there, we're always taking challenges, and I was ready to race anybody, and sure. so I was quite quite the street racer. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of what uh, what my background was and everything. And um, so then, when I got into the police department, um, I read about a program down in the states where they used police cars as race cars. And I'm thinking to myself, what a novel idea. Um, how can I do this something similar up here? As I really started to uh, really started to realize there was a us versus them with when I mean that is a police culture versus the car culture. Sure. And uh, I realized this one time I was cruising downtown. We were on patrol, me and my partner, and. All of a sudden, uh, we see this nice, you know, nice street car go by, jacked up. It had the, the loud mufflers on it and everything. And my partner says, he goes, oh, hey, let's go harass this guy. And uh, it dawned on me. It's like, why are we doing that? What's he doing wrong? He's not speeding. He's, you know, everything looks good. He's just out sure. cruising. Yep. And uh, so that's when I kind of started to realize that there was this, this difference and I wanted to bridge that. So, uh, yeah, so then I, I pitched a, uh, a proposal to my service and uh, took a little while, about a year, year and a half, and uh, they approved it. So they gave me a, a six-month pilot project, uh, is what they called it. Um, that wasn't, though, without the help of uh, some police uh, teams that had come up from L.A. and Phoenix at the time. And uh, they actually helped pitch my program to uh, the executives, and that really kind of kick-started everything going. So uh, we had this uh, program approved, uh, this idea written down on paper, but no money, no car. So it's like, what do I do? Um, This was back in 1996. And so from there, I went and I borrowed some money from my parents and I found a rolling chassis, which is the 72 duster that we have in our fleet today. Um, This car, we bought a used small block and spent the whole winter getting it ready. And in May of 97, um, we unveiled the duster and the program, it was called Street Legal, uh, to the public. 
And we had uh, L.A. County sheriffs come back up here and unveil it with us. And back then, also, the RCMP had a program called Super Cops, and they had a NOVA. So it was the three teams that uh, kind of unveiled at that time. Wow. Yeah, so that, it's, uh, that's, that's kind of the history of, of how everything kind of got started there. So, and, and, I mean, it, it's it's cool, A, that you're a Mopar guy and had a duster, because I did as well. And, I mean, they are the ultimate sleeper, um, you know, on the street, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, that y- you mentioned that, you know, the appearance of a car, the look of a car, you know, it's louder a bit, that it does attract attention. And I think that's why a lot of guys build you know, good looking street machines and big motors and make them sound nice for people to notice them. But, you know, that you immediately felt that there was that disconnect and you thought to to make a change. Yeah, because I, I became part of both cultures. Right. And and it's like, you know, can I, is there a way I can make a difference? And uh, it was funny because we had this duster and... I'll tell you, people looked at this thing like it was the a UFO coming right out of some alien planet. Right. No one could could put the two together because racing back then that was that was taboo, right? You know, they remember all the bad stories from Speedway, and we remember the good ones as racers. But sure. a lot of the public remember the bad ones, and uh, so I wanted to show and say, hey, you know what, guys, I'm with you on this, and. We set up the car on Jasper Avenue in an empty lot where other cars were kind of uh, always wanting to meet. And, and, you know, cars would cruise, and then they pull into a parking lot, and they sure. meet and talk, and then they continue on. Well, we set up the duster out there, turned on the flashing lights, and I literally was watching these cars turning a block away <laughs> and driving a, or driving away from us. Right. And then... And then then the curiosity would get them, and then one car would drive by. And then they would drive by again. And at about three or four times after cars were driving by, they would pull into the lot. Right. And then they're like, what is this thing? Right? So then we started talking to them and saying, hey, guys, this is who we are. This is what we're about. Next thing you know, we're starting to get invited to car shows and, uh, and, and places like that where the police were never, ever invited to before. So, yeah, we got into Powerama, and we were showing off there. We were going into schools constantly. And, uh, yeah, it just it really started to, the idea really started to explode. That's great. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about the members on your team for Blue Line Racing. Because, obviously, you, you mentioned it takes a group of you. And, uh, yeah, tell us about the, the guys you have working with you and the members of uh, Blue Line Racing. Yeah, so we have, um, our team now consists of five members, sworn, uh, either two retired or sworn police officers, and then we have two civilians as well on the team. Um, So I'm just going to list them by first name. So Terry, he started the program with me, a car enthusiast, and he's got a couple of his own cars he's restoring. He's got a 57 Chevy and a 66 Chevelle. Cool. Uh, He's doing some some rotisserie restorations on that. Uh, Blair, uh, he's a car enthusiast. He has a 66 Mustang that the family owned from brand new, and he's doing a rotisserie uh, restoration on that car. Uh, Keen, he's a car enthusiast. He's always had lots of cars and bikes. He's restored, he's modified, he's changed. And uh, he then became also part of the 780 Tuners, and he's a... integral part of management in the driven car show nowadays oh great um yeah so keen has got a really great vision for where the where the um, the, the things are going and that's what kind of keeps us uh, uh innovative so it, uh, he's uh, he's a valuable part of the team uh then we pulled on uh, james he's a car enthusiast uh mechanic and he has uh, he has his own Nova that he had restored, and he's going to be racing that most uh, Friday nights now at the Street Legal this year. And his one of his kids has a junior dragster, so he's going to be actively involved in the junior dragster program. Great. Um, James also was part of uh, a, a bike motorbike program that uh, ran the uh, the police decals. And um, there's only one one guy left on that team. Uh, Ryan, 
he he still goes out there and and races on the uh, the road course with the bike. Our civilian members, we have Roy. He's been a circle track and road racer for decades. Um, track champion at many different tracks. Uh, his dad got him into racing from a real young age. He's a licensed mechanic, so he's always a valuable resource when we need a uh, helping hand fixing something. And uh, Ihor, uh, he owns the uh, the jet cars that are always out at Castro Raceway. Cool. That you see. Yeah. So um, he's... Uh, He's actively involved, uh, kind of behind the scenes, with us. Yeah, so that's that's uh, that's, that's the team right now, and uh, uh, yeah, so everybody's kind of busy doing their thing, but yeah, we still seem to get together and and uh, make all our appearances and 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 do our shows. That's awesome. So to this point, Mike, I mean, it's you, you've you know. You put some time in, you got a, obviously a great team around you and people that are, you know, they have careers with EPS, but at, at heart they're car people and, and they enjoy racing and stuff. So to this point, you know, what do you feel are the major accomplishments of uh, Blue Line Racing? Well, you know, we've been truly blessed with the support and success of the program from the community. Um, we've met and been fortunate to meet such great celebrities, hung out with Chip Foose, John Force. Uh, we've been featured in magazines. Uh, Barry McGuire interviewed us on Car Crazy, cool. displayed at SEMA. Um, yeah, so the support, actually, we, we get North American-wide. Um, but uh, that's just a small portion. I think that's more the, the result of what we've been doing, so I wouldn't call that an accomplishment. Um, we've, we started embracing new roads. That's a, uh, it's a traffic safety, more spinoff from street legal because street legal was just speed and, and racing. So embracing new roads is attitude, distracted driving, impaired driving and speed. So we did not, uh, 18 schools in 2019. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, we've been part of the racing for a cure, which, uh, takes children from the stallery for rides in exotic cars. Been doing that for uh, about five years now. And I'll tell you, that that really, really hits home when you see these children. They have like half an hour off their life support, coming out of the hospital, jumping in a car, and then going back to the hospital. So it uh, kind of puts things in perspective. Um, the, uh, I think, you know, the relationships that we've cultivated in the community, um, I guess mentioned 780 tuners when uh, back when we had just the duster, we um, saw that the Fast and Furious was on TV screen or on the movie screen and stuff like that was coming out, and the culture was starting to do a tuner shift sure. away from the old uh, muscle cars and going into the tuner cars. So uh, we approached Hyundai, and they donated us the Tiburon. Oh, it was wow. a pre-production car, yeah, and uh, so we were we were allowed to use this car, and that opened doors for us. And once we had a tuner car, well, 780 tuners just jumped on board with us. And uh, Mark from uh, from that organization, he loved our message, and so anybody that wanted to start street racing, they got shut down and told you can't be part of the group. So wow. that was that was really nice. Yeah, so that really really helped jumpstart uh, uh, again our program a few years later. Um, but you know what? I think one of the major biggest major accomplish- accomplishments, uh, with everything being said, is when a young person approaches me and says I've changed their life. You know, because of the presentation or because of seeing what we've done, they're no longer going to street race or they realize that it's not smart and they go up to the track or stuff like that. And we've had we've had quite a few. And, you know, and it's uh, that puts the wind in your sails and just keeps you going year after year. Yeah, I, I bet. And I, I mean, yeah. that for sure, you know, um, it kind of leads into my, my next question. Um in your experience, do you, like, is there a particular age demographic that are at a higher risk? Well, you know, traffic safety is is for everybody, and and that's not just that's not just vehicles. That's pedestrians, that's sure. bicycles, you know, the big trucks. Everybody, um, pedestrians have to play their part 
uh, when they can't just uh, in Edmonton, you you have a you you have a pedestrian right of way law here, but that can't be without the pedestrian using some uh, intelligence and looking before they cross. Just because right. you hit the the crosswalk lights doesn't give you the the right of way to to step in front of a car because guess what the law's on your side but the law of physics isn't right so yeah yeah um, but it, I think from a young age we're taught that speed and racing is exciting and like I said I had Hot Wheels and I'm sure a lot of people did you, bet. Uh, you know the movies that are out there cars and all that. Um, the video games, Need for Speed, and all these other things, you know, and, and the kids just, it's all exciting. And then they turn 16, they get their driver's license, and all of a sudden we're told them, whoa, no, you can't do any of that. Right. And they look at you and they're like, well, what do you mean? Well, you got to be responsible. You can't speed. You can't, and, and you can't do anything because there's a whole book of offenses that you could be charged with, right? And uh, you couple that, with the inexperience, and it could be a real recipe for a disaster. So who's at risk? Um, I'm going to say everybody, because you have a young driver who's inexperienced, wants to test out their abilities on the street, loses control, they can hit anybody, right? You have an experienced driver. Take myself, for example. I was an experienced driver 24 years on the job, and I crashed a police car. Right. So luckily it was a single vehicle rollover and I didn't hurt anybody, but you know, uh, that's, that's what happens, right? When you start taking the risks. And, uh, so yeah, it's, um, everybody, I think it, it comes down to the attitude, just uh, everybody's driving attitude. That, yeah. And I mean, you know, we, we kind of touched on a little bit, Corey and I about, you know, the ability nowadays to buy, you know, cars that make five, six, seven hundred horsepower, and and you know, we all think we can drive, but you know, the ability of these cars and and the things that they're capable of now put a lot of people at risk. Not only yourself as a driver, but everybody around you. So, but definitely your point there, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the the next question, yeah, I, go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say absolutely nobody buys a, a seven hundred horsepower Hellcat. And just wants to go to the grocery store and pick up their groceries. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, that, yeah, yeah, definitely not the thought process when you're paying for it. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, the the next question, I mean, with your experience in your in your career, what is the real impact street racing has on communities? Well, you know, we all know street racing is dangerous, but yet some continue to do it. And is, is it because of the thrill? Is it because of their attitude? Um, they a lot of a lot of them want to justify by saying, "Well, I'm out in a in a in a remote industrial area, and I'm not hurting anybody." Well, you could hurt yourself. You could hurt a bystander that's out there. Um, by the time somebody calls and an ambulance gets to you, it could be too late. Um, cars that speed around the neighborhoods. Um, I, I hear it from people in the neighborhood. We don't feel safe. They get mad. They want to take matters into their own hands uh, because the police can't be everywhere. Sure. So the, you know the city, the city's trying to reduce speed limits, and uh, you know that creates a lot of controversy. Uh, they have photo radar everywhere. Again, you know controversy. But um, I think if everybody just had the attitude of you know, just like with with this with this COVID nineteen right now, let's all do our part. Let's all just kind of respect on what the the um, legislators are saying, and I think the everybody can get along a lot better. Um, that's kind of like whenever I would would go out into a community with my squad. Um, if you ever saw on. The, on the billboard signs that said big ticket event yes, throughout the city. For sure. Yep. Okay, well that's that was what we called Operation Twenty Four. So we were actually going out and writing tickets. You would look for certain infractions, speeding being one of them, and seat belts and distracted driving, stuff like that. Well, I always told my boss, I'm gonna go into the communities where they want to see us. 
you right. know, go in somewhere past school zones, go into these areas where the cars, we we hear that the cars are driving fast through the neighborhoods, and we would try to combat that instead of, you know, coming off of the Hyundai and into a 70 zone and you're just slowing it down, but, you know, you get pulled in, right? Sure. So um, if people do feel that they need to change their community because cars are speeding away, they can phone, uh, they can phone the uh, EPS and advise that what's going on in the community. And EPS will do a study. They will send out uh, patrol or traffic members and uh, enforce it. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, for myself, um, you know, what you're saying about the community stuff, I guess, you know, when I first got married, didn't have kids, you know, I, I didn't notice those things as much going through the neighborhood or hear somebody accelerating to up the road somewhere, you know, but now that, you know, I have my kids and we send them outside to the yard to play and they're on their bikes up and down in front of the houses and the neighbor's houses that, you know, I'm actually that person that uh, that you mentioned that, you know, if somebody goes flying by at 60 or 70 or 100 kilometers an hour that, you know, I'm that guy that, you know, if I caught that guy, it's not going to be a good thing because I'm thinking of he's endangering my family now because he decided to accelerate through a, you know, a neighborhood and, and really do nothing other than make some noise because he put a new muffler on his vehicle. Exactly. I, that you, you remind me of a story when I was still at home and I had my duster and I was driving around the neighborhood and I was in first gear. And of course, I'd rev it up to five, six thousand RPM as I'm driving around. And this guy jumps off the sidewalk and stops me. And I looked, and his son was over on the sidewalk yet. And he says, "What are you doing, speeding through the neighborhood?" And I says, "Actually, I'm only in first gear. I'm not going that fast." But he heard me. It was loud. Sure. Looked at the car. He's making assumptions, right? And and uh, also preventing me. Maybe I would shift it to second or third, right? Right. But, uh, so yeah, um, at least though he, he did something, and I, I don't want people to take matters into their own hands, but, you know, when you get frustrated and stuff like that, it's going to happen, and then, uh, and then things can escalate from there. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's something to be said about, you know, families and kids around, you know, um, so it, can you, can you share with us, with us some experiences that, you know, really hit home that, that help you, you know, every day get up and go, you know what, I, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent people and young people or older, doesn't matter the age, but to get them to stop street racing or is, is there anything through your career or just life experiences that have really hit home that, that give you that extra drive to continue with blue line racing and, and try to make more of a difference, you know, more than you've already have? Yeah, you know, um, okay, with my career, I've, I've seen the aftermath of street racing. I've, I've uh, had to go to the scenes. I've had to make the appearance to the family, telling them about a fatality. Um, and then, of course, like I said, my own experience as well. Um, and it's just, uh, I read on Facebook when there would be something happening, and then the comments through that, and people would say, "Oh, I can't believe this is in our community." Or I can't. Believe. Well, I've seen it for twenty-seven years. It is happening. It's always happened, right? So it's when we try to when we we try to tell them through an educational thing, say, "Guys, hey, you know what? Don't do this. Don't do this." There's reasons why we say don't do it because right. if you could plug a video into what I've seen, it wouldn't be pretty. Right. Um, but you know what, you, you, at the end of the day, I was able to punch the clock, go home and, uh, move on to the next, ne next day where these families, they can't, they're going to live with that for the rest of their life. So if I can continue being that advocate to say, look, at, we don't want these fatalities happening. We don't want to have the road rage happening, uh, stuff like that, then, uh, then that's that's all worth it. Um, I just want to, you know, you say like, yeah, five hundred plus horsepower. That feels great, but you got to know where to use it. So right. be smart, race the strip and not the street. Um, it's dangerous. It's illegal. 
but uh, it's also a matter of the respect for that community you live in. Um, people, people will say, oh, well, street legal drags is expensive. And I question, I'm like, okay, how is, you know, $40, $50 expensive when you look at getting a 300 and some dollar ticket, uh, your vehicle sees your insurance rates through the roof, if you can even get insurance after that, uh, potentially criminal charges, like, you, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it just, it's not a valid reason for it. So that's, uh, <clears throat> so that's why I keep trying to keep doing it and, after uh, this many years, I, I would have never, ever guessed that uh, we'd still be out there doing it. But you know what? Um, it's still gaining momentum. It's still uh, it's still a great uh, thrill for me to be doing it. So I'm going to keep doing it. That's awesome. Um, we're going to shift yeah. gears a little bit um, and talk more about Blue Line. Um, you know, your, your passion, you know, Duster, drag strip, and stuff, but I know Blue Line just doesn't focus on drag racing. What other motorsports do you guys, or are you involved with? Well, we uh, <clears throat> we've had members on the team, like I had mentioned, uh, the road race, uh, the circle track, endurance racing, and the motorbikes. So, uh, pretty much, if it's going to have wheels and an engine, we may get involved. Right. Uh, we've talked about doing drifting. We've talked about doing. Uh, even one of the cars, uh, we, we toyed around with uh, Pike's Peak and said, uh, wouldn't that be fun to do? So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, if it's out there, we want to maybe give it a try sometime. Cool. Um, yeah. Now, the cars that you currently have, give us a rundown on, uh, well, we, you talked about the Tiburon, and we know the Duster. Uh, what other cars do, uh, does Blue Line have in the fleet here right now? Well, we got an 08 Challenger. And that car was uh, donated by Chrysler. It was a it was a Challenger SRT8 that was uh, slated to go stateside, and it got damaged on the assembly line. So uh, they they um, took the serial numbers off, and they donated the car to us. And uh, so then we had it transformed into what we what we put it together. It's got a a uh, six one board and stroke, so it's a four twenty six uh, cubic inch uh, supercharged. Hemi engine in it, and uh, the best time on that car is uh, 9.65, and uh, Terry Drew does most of the driving in that car. Um, I do most of the driving in the Duster. Um, we've had that car transformed. I, I don't think that there's, other than the sheet metal, there's nothing else original from when we first bought that car. Right. <clears throat> so it's, it's been uh, gone over. Uh, the 09 Mustang. That was donated by a local dealership and uh, Ford of Canada. Uh, Kean was uh, the spearhead on that one. And, uh, and then a few years later, uh, Blair talked with uh, Shelby of Canada, and they put in a new, brand-new twin-turbo Coyote engine into that car. Cool. So it's run, yeah, in the 950s, and it's, uh, it's still street legal, but barely. Right. So it's, uh, yeah. Um, and then last year, uh, Alfa Romeo of Edmonton was uh, uh, gracious enough to donate us a, a Julia Quadrifoglio. Okay. And uh, that car we used to go to schools and the racing for a cure, like I mentioned, and a bunch of other little car shows that were more exotic in nature. So we displayed with Lamborghinis, Ferraris, um, and Porsches, you name it, stuff like that. We were we were uh, on display with them. So again, that presence in the community, always being able to deliver our message, no matter what fashion it is, then um, that was a that was great to have that car. And that car there, little twin turbo V six. Holy smokes, does that car move fast? <laughs> it had carbon fiber uh, body parts on it, real lightweight. Yeah. So that's a, that's a nice, fun car. <clears throat> um, then I mentioned um, Kean, he built a, a Fox body Mustang. Okay. And that was the, he, he built it originally for the Chump Car Endurance Race. Okay. But uh, now he's uh, looking at uh, making it legal for all styles of road racing. And uh, James has a, uh, I think it's a 69 or a 70 Nova 
So finally, we're going to have a Chevy in our fleet. Um, we've it's taken uh, twenty or twenty three <laughs> years to have it finally, but right. uh, yeah. Uh, and then um, Roy, well, he's got a he's got like a what is it a mid nineties Mustang that he runs on the road course at Castro. Okay. And uh, yeah, and they uh, they go out there and and. Uh, He's he, he's very very successful with that with that car. He built that car right from the ground up himself. That's cool. In his garage. So yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I'm happy to say, and mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell our viewers and listeners again that uh, it's always Mopar's first, and uh, I know that doesn't bother you at all. But yeah, it's uh, it's nice when Mopar guys are always first. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. My my heart my heart is in the Mopar yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, what's the furthest you've been? I know I've, we've seen you in in, uh, in Vegas at the Mopars at the Strip, but do you guys try to go all across North America? Yeah, you know, um, we're, we're members of Beat the Heat, which is an international organization of police race teams. Um, so I've joined them at a number of races down in the States. Um, so the farthest I've gone uh, to date would be right at the Oklahoma-Texas border called Ardmore where we had the world finals for Beat the Heat. And then uh, the next weekend, it was in Tulsa, where we did some grudge matching against streetcars. Oh, there you go. And yeah, yeah. So so Vegas, um, Oklahoma, uh, the years passed. We've gone to Boise. We've gone to Spokane. Um, and then, of course, all over Alberta, uh, Saskatoon, they had a program. So we would go back and forth supporting each other showing our, our programs at each track. Um, but uh, what we're doing is it's always been historically we've been just police cars versus police cars, whether that's in a trophy uh, competition or exhibition runs. But what's really starting to catch on now are the police grudge matches. Yeah. Where we challenge street racers or they challenge us. And uh, we did that last year in Vegas, Edmonton, and Tulsa, and uh, really picked up some momentum. The social media hype was beautiful. I loved it. <clears throat> um, you know, all the smack talk and stuff going back and forth. And and then, uh, so we talked to other tracks for 2020 to try to expand. Um, we talked to Boise. I talked to Norwalk. We've talked to uh, St. Louis. Um, but, of course, now everything's on hold because of uh, of COVID-19, right? So, right. It's, yeah. But what we have our fingers crossed that, you know, the schedule will just be pushed and, and uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll get some racing in this year, I'm sure, just just all on when. Um, that's cool yeah. that you bring up the grudge racing um, because I was going to definitely ask you about that. Um, so let's say, you know, we're, we're past COVID and things are back to normal and the track's open. Um, do you guys accept call outs for the street legal stuff to, to do a, to do a grudge race or is there certain times or I guess with that, you know, when you do the events that you guys are, are at, do you, do you do ride alongs in the cars down the strip or anything, you know, that, that fans or people have interest that, Hey, I get to ride in the, the challenger or, or the Tiburon or the Mustang or anything like that. Yeah. You know, okay. So any street legal, we always welcome a grudge match. Okay. If anybody wants to, but at the major events uh, like the Rocky Mountain Nationals or the Hot Dogs Night, we're going to start to do a more organized uh, one, like we did last year, okay. uh, where we're actually going to pre-plan the people and and stuff like that coming out. So it just wouldn't be at the track at the uh, uh, improv. It right. would be something that's already been uh, scheduled. Um, the uh, the ride-alongs, we, we, every car is equipped with a second seat for ride-alongs. Uh, usually we save those ride-alongs for either the track has some type of, uh, or media, they have some type of a contest that goes on or something like that, and then they ask us if we can give a ride. Um, and then um, we, uh, we just, we're thinking of doing a, uh, a membership okay. to Blue Line. So with that, we were going to be able to select one lucky member to 
be part of a, a crew member for a day and go for a ride along in the car of their choice and stuff like that. That's great. I mean, yeah. I, I, I watched last year's at the Rockies, you know, uh, there was a, a Turbo Camaro and some cars that uh, you guys were racing. And I thought it was great. I think everybody was into it. And it's heads up and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always fun to watch, right? Because when are you going to get to race a, a police car any other time other than if you're trying to get away? <laughs> Well, exactly. You know, it, it, we got to keep we got to keep uh, racing really fresh and exciting uh, because we want to make it more exciting out at a racetrack than what they're doing on the street. So, if we can say, "Hey, guys, you know what? You think you're fast? Come out, race a cop, and uh, we're going to do it heads up, eighth mile, and uh, right, run what you brung." Um, I know Scott, good friend of mine in LA, he's done amazing amazing things with his program down there and he's really into the grudge match racing now and uh it's uh it's really really taken off and and uh, so we're we're mirroring that and going to be continuing that up here right on so is that how you see the program continue to progress and grow that you're, you're trying to uh adapt to you know the the you know street outlaw thing and heads up and eighth mile is that how you see the program growing in the near future here yeah, I think so. Um, uh, again, Scott has talked to uh, some of those street racers from Street Outlaws, and uh, he's actually talked to a uh, producer and that. And uh, unfortunately, it's the um, the uh, channel, uh, the Discovery Channel and places like that, other channels, they don't want to actually bring us on because then all of a sudden it legitimizes the some race. of that bad boy racing sure. right but um no if we can you know what if we can find somebody who'd be interested enough in picking up uh what we're doing and then running with it uh that would be fantastic because i i think that this is going to be a the growing trend right now you can see it with uh even a castrol um the cash for uh, cash is king yep. series and the, and all of that like that's really becoming popular so it's uh <laughs> I think that's uh, that's where we're going to be running, uh, gearing towards. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, like you said, you can piggyback off of you know what's happening and what they're portraying on TV and what people are watching, and and it's all about heads up. And the bracket thing is kind of fallen a little bit, but I mean, like Cash is King is still a bracket race that they have at Castrol, and but uh, you know, it's heads up racing. You know, it's two cars. You know. You have it. The other guy has it. Let's see who gets to the line first, and and that's that's what the race is about. So, that that's great that you guys are trying to adapt and and uh, move forward on what mainstream stuff is happening, and and trying to be involved and, and keep people's interest up when it comes to uh, heads up racing. Um, yeah. On the uh, so obviously we're waiting on a schedule, you know, for you know waiting for COVID to pass us here and, and move forward, but. If someone wanted to know your guys' schedule, is it on the website? Is that the best place to find it? Um, I'd love to say yes, but uh, we've been a little negligent in uh, putting it out there right now. Um, all our school appearances are put on hold, right. and uh, so the, we're going to have to reschedule everything there. Um, racing for a cure, hopefully in June. The Rockies, hopefully in July. Okay. Uh, I do have some of my American uh, racing friends, uh, police race teams, ready to gear it up to come back up here again and uh and have some fun so yeah i, I really hope that this is uh going to be put past us quickly and then we can resume our lives as normal I could. Um, but yeah we we will we will uh, have to work on getting that schedule onto our website and <clears throat> and also our social media pages yeah i think everybody understands that uh, it's we're just waiting here until uh, things are better so that we can uh, move forward uh, normally with life. Um, yeah, I've seen the the trailer, and and uh, you know, obviously, you and I have met. You know, <clears throat> giving a shout out to you know your sponsors and people that work with Blue Line Racing. You know, I'd like you to have the opportunity if you if you choose to, you know, acknowledge the people that uh, other than the members, obviously, that you guys are the core and drive it, but those that help out on the outside. Well, you know, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the Edmonton Police Association for endorsing us, allowing the use of their crest. Um, if people look closely, it is actually not the Edmonton Police Service. <coughs> and uh, so so it is the association that uh, allows us to continue. Um, we have so many sponsors 
from uh, the local area and across uh, North America. Um, each one of them is on our sides of our cars, on our trailers. We wouldn't exist or continue without them. And uh, so the list is many, and I, I don't want to take up all the time listing everybody out, but every one of them, <clears throat> big or small, is so important. So it uh, really helps us deliver our message. Oh, sorry, I got a little, little frog in the throat here. No, no problem, no problem at all. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, like you said, it, it takes those sponsors and those people pushing to help the program go, and it wouldn't be there if, if they didn't. How does, how or can someone get involved with Blue Land Racing? Yeah, we would love everybody to just like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Uh, if you know anyone who's willing to sponsor, uh, those are always welcome too. I know times are extremely tough. Uh, we are a non-profit charitable organization, um, but uh, <clears throat> we're competing that same pool as all the others. Right. Um, for 2020, we're going to have a, a complete line of Blue Line merchandise for sale. We're going to have T-shirts, hoodies, die casts, stuff like that. Um, they're all ready and sitting in Vegas because we were going to pick them up when we went down to Vegas. But uh, that all got... Right. It all got canceled, so, right. so I'm working on trying to get those shipped up here so we can start selling them. Um, and uh, and then we're like I said, we're trying to we're looking at putting together a membership program. VIP members will get certain privileges and stuff like that, but that's still uh, we're still developing that. So that's uh, right now pretty much how I, you know people can get involved. Uh, obviously, at the track, we've had so many people come up and they see us. We're we're just like every other race car. We break parts. We go through uh, go through stuff, and they've dropped what they're doing, and they're helping us in the pits and 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 uh, doing that. And it's it's always a lot of fun, and and we always have a lot of laughs. So it's uh, that's uh, that's how how we uh, people get involved all the time. That's that's great to hear. Um, yeah. So if if anybody any of our listeners or or anything like that want to learn more about Blue Line Racing. Uh, website, good spot, you know, uh, Instagram, that type of stuff? Yeah, so bluelineracing.ca. Okay. Uh, Facebook page is at APS Racer. And Instagram is blue underscore line underscore racing. Awesome. And and that, uh, you know, I, I check them out, obviously, uh, to, you know, prepare for our chat here. And, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of information uh, to read and understand and, and learn more about the, the program you guys are running. Um, just in, in ending here, Mike, uh, any final thoughts or any other messages you'd like to uh, give to our listeners before we uh, wrap it up? Well, I just want everybody to uh, stay safe, and uh, hopefully the snow will be gone soon, and when it is, let's get our cars out there, but uh, be uh, smart about it and, and uh, make sure we get home every night. Great message. Thank you very much, Mike. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, everybody, for Thank tuning you. in. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in to JB's PowerCast. Check out jbspowercenter.com for the latest updates. You can find the JB's PowerCast at jbspowercenter.com, YouTube, and Facebook. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. JB's PowerCast is a JB's Power Center production and is produced by Stephen M.D. and Sean Lansman.